Hello and welcome back to another tech support episode of Rejected Sins. As I've retrofitted my Casio FZ1 with a USB floppy drive emulator, I thought I'd share some of the experience I've collected on the way with you guys. Let's start by looking at the hardware options for replacing those old floppy disk drives on your synths. These usually came with something like this, a 3.5 inch floppy drive not too dissimilar to from what you found on old IBM PCs and other home computers of the day. While physically these are often the same or similar to PC floppy drives, many synths and samplers use industry standards that slightly differ from your run-of-the-mill PC floppy drives. Most 3.5 inch drives are connected with a 34 pin cable and have separate connectors for power. This is also the case with most synths. They however seem to utilize pin layouts that slightly differ from those typically found on old fashioned PCs. The second big difference is that many synths and samplers use disk file systems that differ from those used on IBM PCs. Again the disks you use for these are physically the same for both use cases, but the difference, sometimes exotic or custom file systems can become a serious emulation issue. So because of different file systems, different pin layouts and a number of additional technical issues, just getting any random floppy disk emulator off eBay simply won't cut it in almost any case. Funny enough though, with some modification, almost any dirt cheap floppy emulator off eBay could actually do the job just fine, as almost all of these are usually so-called GoTek drives or clones of GoTek drives. GoTek seem to have become the ubiquitous hardware base for almost all floppy replacement projects these days because they are easily modifiable, expandable, reliable and dirt cheap at the same time. Your run of the mill GoTek drive will look something like this or this, and the only thing holding it back from actually doing the job you wanted to do is the firmware on the GoTek drive, handling the emulation. This firmware can be replaced quite easily if you know how to use a soldering iron and have a very basic understanding of fiddling with electronics and flashing of software. But even if you don't, there are always enterprising people on eBay who, for just a small fee, can handle this bit for you and sell pre-flashed and sometimes even pre-configured drives for specific synths. These drives on eBay, however, should not be confused with HXC drives. Those are a different affair. A commercial product developed and sold by John Francois Del Nero on hxc2001.com. HXC drives are usually a more costly affair, but you'll get an actual product complete with a community built around it and proper support. While going down my route will save you some money, it will most likely require some hands-on action by the user as well. So what we are looking at today are GoTech drives running the fabulous Flash Floppy firmware by KRF. This firmware supports a ton of machines and brings with it a lot of nice features like support for hardware mods like OLED screens and rotary encoders, a very granular configurability as well as convenient firmware updates via USB drive. If you want to get a cheap GoTech off eBay and flash it yourself, the firmware and flashing instructions are provided by KRF's GitHub project page. I for once went the lazy route and got a pre-flashed and pre-modded drive off eBay. I got it from this eBay seller who was kind enough to help me out with some advice when I ran into configuration issues. I'm not affiliated with or sponsored by this seller, I'm just grateful for his friendly advice when I needed it. So time to put on some gloves and a surgical mask. Let's open her up. It's always a good idea to take some pictures of the process as a reference while you are at it. And don't forget to count your screws, you don't want a loose screw rolling around in your synth potentially shorting things. Now, first you'll have to remove quite a few screws. I'll start at the back here, you have to remove 7 identical big black screws in total, 3 on the bottom left and 3 on the bottom right, plus this one on the very right. Next there are another 3 screws each at the bottom of the sides. Finally there's one more screw located at the bottom front. These are the only screws you'll have to remove in order to be able to flip the front open like a car hood. Carefully open it, grabbing both sides and flipping it upwards like this. Next we'll have to remove the drive by first removing these 2 screws. These hold the drive cover in place that you can also flip open like this. You might have to wiggle it a bit though. Next you'll have to remove the four screws holding the drive itself in place. Carefully disconnect both the power and the ribbon cables. In order to properly connect the new drive you'll have to rotate the ribbon cable. If you can see the little nose on the cable connector you've connected it the wrong way around and this will happen once you power up the synth. One thing you want to make sure before you install the drive cover is that you've set the jumpers correctly. As some machines require certain jumpers on the GoTek drive to be set for the synth or sampler to be able to properly interact with the drive. Finding out what jumpers have to be set again can be a bit fiddly and varies from machine to machine. In some cases no jumpers at all are needed. In the case of my KSCO FZ1 I had to set the following jumpers. This part might be the most tricky but it seems to mostly depend on jumper 2 having to be set or not, so it doesn't take too much experimentation. 
Now connect the ribbon cable the right way around, don't forget the power cable, align the drive and screw it back into place. Then put the drive cover back into place and screw it back in. Don't forget to put all the remaining screws back in, there are 14 big black screws that you'll have to put back in. Next up, and assuming you've swapped the drive correctly, we'll have to take a look at the main config file called ff.cfg. This file has to be put either into the root folder of USB stick or into a dedicated subfolder called ff. Flashropy reads the config file on boot up and stores the values in the drive's memory, so in theory you'll only have to configure your drive once. There are a lot of things that can be configured through the config file, but all it needed for the FZ1 to run were four lines of code. Interface Sugar sets the pin settings of the drive to Sugar configuration. Host Casio conveniently sets a lot of more complex options just the way I need them for the drive to work. Pin 2 Auto and Pin 3 4 Auto make these pins work the way the host setting tells them to. There's one more step before we can start using the drive. For some disk images this might be optional, as Flashropy can directly read a large number of image formats, but as the format I found the Casio image therein was not among them, I used HXC Floppy Emulator, a software available for Windows and Mac, to convert the images to universal HFE images. With all that's done, let's see the drive in action. As you can see there is a small gap resulting from the fact that the new drive is a tiny bit slimmer than the original one. I'm just mentioning this as some aesthetically minded snob, uh, I mean uh, purists, might be put off by the look, but then again these people will probably stick to floppies anyway. As you can see I went with the luxurious top of the shelf modded Gotex, so I can select disk images with a rotary knob, see the file names on the OLED screen, and the built-in buzzer even gives off some nice crisp disk loading sounds when I load the disk. Disk loading speeds aren't too bad either, sure it takes some time. But then again, so did the real floppies. So I hope this video might uh, help some people get their Gotex up and running, bringing their vintage toys into the 21st century. As this is the end of the video, the only thing left for me to do is to say goodbye and see you soon maybe with another synth or possibly even more of this sampler that actually is also a pretty mean synth.